Hello, I'm Brother Theodore. I'm Sister Wynn. And we're your catechist tonight for RCIA. Today we're going to be talking about Jesus, who he is, and the mystery that he is. I know you, many of you are new to the faith. Uh, some of you are coming to the fullness of the faith in the church. So it's always a good time for us as we enter the church, uh, enter the fullness of the church, to be reminded of who Jesus is, um, and particularly that he's our Savior. As Christians, we're always thankful for God's salvation to us. And whenever we want to tell somebody about Jesus, about our choice to enter the church, it's because Jesus saved us. So we're going to talk about who Jesus is. There's a lot of metaphysics that goes with it, but it's more important that we just keep track of a few things. The first four things we want to keep track of are God, man, sin, and Jesus. And to start us off, Sister will tell us about how those four, thing, four things came together in one place. Yeah, we start with the Garden of Eve. God creates man. From the beginning, God created man according to his image. The Lord made a beautiful garden for him to live. One day, what took a drift from Adam sighs and made a woman. When Adam awoke, he found a wife, Eve. Adam was so very happy to have her. God told the man and woman that this was their job to take care of your new home. And God blessed them. Also, God said to them, Help yourself to anything you like, but never touch the trees in the middle of the garden. This tree will give knowledge of good and evil. If you eat this food, you will die. One day, they fall in the sin, the sins of disobey God. Sin is berries that prevents their relationship between God and man. From there, humans did not live in the garden anymore. So they have to deal with death and suffering in their life. Death enter the world, and the darkness also covers upon the world. They have to work hard to live their life, but God's love continues to reveal for us to Abraham and Isaac. That's right. So let's just look again at what's happened so far in Eden. We have God. You want to see that all right? Mm -hmm. He creates. And in this, we call it an exit. It comes out of God. It's not an accident. It's something that he wanted. Something we should keep in mind is God is love. And his creation is an act of love. He loves creation. He loves man. So he gives us ourselves, our life. What happens in creation is that man is given a mission in this creation to cultivate the earth, to uh, take care of his spouse, and she likewise, to be a companion to Adam. They were also supposed to eat of anything in the garden except the food of the knowledge of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So when they did eat, they disobeyed God. Not listening to God becomes man's sin. It might seem something small like fruit, but really what disobedience says is, we don't want God, and we don't want his love. When we say that, it makes us very hard to have some type of return or even better, 
a communion with God. Now, we should keep these things in mind as we think about Abraham and Isaac. So we'll just keep this as a reference. God creating exit, man coming back to return. So we have God, and he created... And in the course of creation, he has Abraham. Like Sister said, death entered the world because of sin. And Abraham was getting on in years. If it wasn't so bad that he was going to die, it was even worse that he was sterile. There's just no life for him anymore. His own life will go, will go away, and he has no offspring to carry on into the next generation. God, good, loving, gives Abraham Isaac. It's very important to see here that God is always giving us more than what he gave before. Even back in, the, even back in Eden, when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, God made leather garments for them to cover their nakedness, to cover their shame. So God is always giving us something more. He's always coming to our rescue, always coming to, to remedy what we're losing, what, we're, what we lack. Abraham's going to lose his life. He's sterile, but he gives him Isaac so that he can see his life carried on in his children. Then God surprises Abraham. He calls Isaac back. The return. This is not great news for Abraham. He feels like he's going to lose Isaac into sacrifice. We often think of sacrifice as losing something. And particular to this time in history, there was often child sacrifice in Canaan, in ancient Israel, before uh, the Exodus and, and a lot of the other um, events that we come to know about Israel. But Abraham obeys. He's going to send Isaac back. And what later Christian writer, or what early Christian writers will tell us, much later than Abraham, is that Abraham hoped against hope that Isaac would somehow be raised from the dead even after this sacrifice. So the sacrifice, more importantly, becomes an act of obedience. This brings man, brings Abraham back to God, more than just Isaac. God, being love, being infinite, being full of surprise in many ways, gives Isaac back to Abraham. And in this way, sacrifice is no longer to be thought of as losing Isaac. But it becomes about something like redoubling the gift. In a way, when we say redoubling the gift, what we had before comes back to us, maybe in different ways. But even more so, God really starts to stand out to us. It's his act of love. It's giving first Isaac and then giving him back and giving Abraham promises of generations to come that we see more and more given back to us by one act of obedience. We should keep a, a few of, uh, most of this in mind as we approach Jesus about the sacrifice that he gives us. In particular, let's add this to our kind of uh, leaderboard here of what's going on. Uh, we should see that God gives the remedy. He provides what we need in order to reach God. Because as it stands, there is an infinite gap between us and God. And there's nothing that we can do, nothing that we can bring, that's going to close this gap. God is always going to be the one to provide. And in so much as he calls back things to himself, 
we inch a little bit closer in this gap, but all because God is, is inviting us, is bringing us to him through the people and the things and the persons that he provides for us to, to come back to him. Again, through acts of obedience, but acts of obedience that are, are all about love. Abraham mourned the loss of Isaac because he loved him. So now we come to Jesus. Again, we have God, who is love. We have an infinite gap between man and God. So God gives us Jesus. Again, his creation, everything coming out of God. Now something we want to cover here is when we talk about Jesus, he is fully man and fully God. We talk about two natures. That's right. Mm -hmm. There are two natures to Christ. And it's interesting how these two work together and really bring about this gap, or really close this gap that's been brought about. So that way, we can come back to God to return, to have communion. Now, in many ways, nobody would dispute that Jesus was a man. Why so? Well, he dies on the cross. He's a man because death reigns in his members. He suffered. He ate. He slept. All these accounts of the Gospels tell us that he was truly a man. He was even born of a human parent, of Mary. Now, was he God? This seems to be a tough question sometimes these days. And I think it's related also to um, the loss of God in just anything. Not just in the person Jesus, but it's very hard for people to see Jesus, to see God, uh, even if, if they want to say it's Jesus. Maybe there's a way that we can see God, and particularly see God in Jesus. And that happens in the sacrifice. Excuse me. Remember what we said about Abraham and God? God gave to Abraham Isaac, and in calling Isaac back, he gave, he gave Isaac back to him. In this way, God becomes visible. God is invisible totally beyond all created things. But in the gifts that he gives us, and how he calls them back but gives us more, he makes himself shown. Seeing is believing in some ways, and hearing is even believing. This is what St. Paul tells us. Unless someone preaches, who will believe? So Jesus comes, and he makes God visible. How so? Well, we can think of miracles, People are astounded by the things they've done. No one's ever seen anything like it. Perhaps more so, we need to think about the resurrection. Here we see again, God gives Jesus. Jesus is called back. He's obedient to God. Remember what we said about obedience. Part of the remedy is obedience. And in that obedience, Jesus saves all of mankind, being without sin, being man, but not sinning, being totally innocent. He's able to take on all the guilt of the world from past, his own time, and even our own time, our own sins, and is able to cancel them out. And God restores him in the resurrection so that man might also be restored. Now, how do we know that the resurrection was from God? Did he really die? You might hear a lot of things about, well, maybe it was just made up or what have you. Let's think about a couple things that we might do or not do based upon some big event that happens in our life. When we look at the martyrs, how many people are willing to die for a lie? I'll grant you the fact that some people can be tricked into cults and that sort of thing. But the long history of the church shows that 
people were willing to lay down their lives in hopes that they would be raised up just as Jesus had been. But I think even more importantly is the love and preaching of the apostles. These are people whose lives were totally changed, totally changed their lives so that they would bring God's love into the world. Just as Jesus made God visible in his love to humanity, to die, to sacrifice himself, to be obedient to God, to bring all of humanity back to God, these people, women and men, by their acts of love and charity, made God visible so that he could be believed, that he is love, that what Jesus had to say to man about love, about God, about converting their way of life, was enough for them to change and even to die for it. So something that we want to see here is, in this, again, work of God giving to man, God giving more to man, and calling back to return, we see God is made visible. And his visibility is love. So we see that Jesus really is man in the way he died and suffered, AIDS, he was born. And we see him as fully God because of the love he had, the power he had, the wisdom he had. He changed people's lives. And I think the people who are gathered here tonight, I know for myself and for sister, Jesus has changed our lives. So anytime we want to talk about God or Jesus, and again, like I said, we all know it, it's very hard for some people to believe in God these days. Our ability to talk about Jesus making God visible and how he has been made visible to us in our own lives is going to draw people more to God or when we have our own doubts, it's going to help us remain true to the God who has called us to return to him through Jesus. It's very important that we think about this because a part of Christian life, the life that you're entering into, is all about drawing more members, always being faithful and true to God and bringing others with you. And we continue to talk about when we go to the Mass for a special Easter virtual Mass. This Mass reminds us the gift that we have received from God, the gift to become a child of God, a children of God in Christ. We also confirm our belief in special way at Easter virtual mass. In bap baptism, we use the red image of water to present God's grace that we have given to us in baptism. We also remember from the beginning God's creation, the Holy Spirit breathed on the water, making a wellspring of holiness. Through water, God drains His grace and life on the earth. Through the water of the Red Sea, God blessed Israel out of slavery slavery to freedom in Christ. Through baptism, God set us free from sins. In the water of children's river, Jesus was baptized by John, and he anointed in, in the Spirit. Moreover, the image of water and blood from the size of Jesus Christ remind us that when we receive baptism, we are sealed in the ultimate sac sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He re-establishes the dignities of humanity with God's love and grace. He is our Savior. Baptism is the gate leading us to the kingdom of God. In baptism, we are sealed in faith with God. 
by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the Easter vigil of Mass, we remember the, the great gift, the gift of faith that we have received from God when we confess our faith with the candle in our hand. Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth? And you will answer, I do. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was born from Virgin Mary, who was crucified, died on the cross, and rose from the dead, and now he sits at the right hand of the Father, and you will answer that, I do. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the communion of saints, and the resurrection of the body and everlasting life? And you also answer that, I do. This is our faith, faith of the church. We hope that we live in, in that what we confess and what we believe. So we can sing Alleluia after that to rejoice the resurrection of Jesus Christ because he is risen to bring us everlasting life. May the candle we light in the Easter vigil and the life we receive when we were baptized with hope enable us to work as children of life and to be the life of Christ in the world. Baptism is salvation because we take on His divinity as He took on our humanity. That's right. A part of our whole idea here is for Sister and I to give you some ways to, to remember, to think about how in the way we worship as Catholics, that we can remember all that God has done for us and who the person of Christ is, being fully man and fully God. One thing that Sister talked about was in baptism, here's my mixer. In baptism, we're reminded of the cross of Christ. When Christ died, water and blood flowed from his side. You'll notice at the opening of every church, there are holy water fonts, or even the baptismal font in which you can dip your hand to remember the, the way Christ has saved you. By the pouring out of his water and blood, we've been cleansed of sin and given the life of God in us. What is the life of God? We talk about God as Father, we talk about him as Son, and Holy Spirit. And sisters talked about the grace of God poured into us, this, this gift that uh, has given us new life. What we can think about when it comes to grace is something I think is really appropriate in Psalm 16. O Lord, preserve me, O God, I take refuge in you. I say to the Lord, you are my God, my happiness lies in you alone. As for those who follow false gods, never will I take their names upon my lips, never will I offer them blood libations. O Lord, it is you who are my portion and cup, it is you yourself who are my prize. Let's pay attention especially to that. God is the gift, the portion. And he is the giver, the cup. That infinite gap that only God could cross, God does with Jesus. He is the gift, giving himself. And what is the gift? God, the infinite, 
the love, everything that we could hope for, everything that might remove us from God, God is closed back together with his son, coming to us as man. But again, his great work of sacrifice and redemption, of resurrection, shows us that we are not far from God. In fact, we have all this communion with him. I think something that might help us understand this a little better is something that Pope Benedict said several years ago. And this is particular when it comes to the Virgin Mary. Sister talked about how God takes on our stuff, right? God became fully man. And we see this in the way that he died. He, dis, he does this so that way he can give of himself. He can give his divinity that we can share in. Sister quoted a prayer from uh, over the offerings before the Eucharist. May the divinity of Christ who came to share in our humanity allow us to share in his divinity. This is the whole Christian life, this sharing of natures, this not a mixing so much, but an empowering, a, an exchange, a, a wonderful exchange of, of divine love with human thanksgiving. And that's what Eucharist means, thanksgiving. What does it mean to have the life of God in us? Like we said, it's grace. Grace is God himself. Let's listen to Pope Benedict. He calls our attention to Mary. If we're ever in doubt about who we should be or how we can live, we should look to Jesus and we should look to Mary. Mary is called full of grace. The Greek word for grace derives from the same root as the words joy and rejoice. When we have God, are we not joyful? Joy comes from grace. One who is in the state of grace can rejoice with deep going, constant joy. By the same token, grace is joy. But what is grace? Grace, we often think of as a supernatural something, something that we carry about in our soul. And we perceive very little of it. Remember we said a lot of people just do not see God or sometimes in our own lives we just don't understand if he's with us or not. And it has become irrelevant to us. In some ways we just kind of talk about it in passing without really grasping what, what is so profound, what is so heavy and glorious about grace. But it's about a connection between us and God, a connection between the I and the thou, between God and man. Full of grace could therefore also be translated, you, translated as, you are full of the Holy Spirit. Your life is intimately connected with God. That's what it means to be a Christian, as Mary was. To be full of grace is to be full of the Holy Spirit, to be full of God, to be full of love and joy and everything else that we can name that is godly. That's what it means to have grace, to have God's gift. Grace, in the proper and deepest sense of the word, is not something that comes from God. It is God himself. Redemption means that God, acting as God truly does, gives us nothing less, less than himself. The gift of God is God. He who has the Holy Spirit is communion with us. Full of grace, therefore, means once again that Mary is a holy, open human being. That's what you guys are doing right now. You're being open to the work of God. For many of you, you've already felt the stirrings of the Holy Spirit of God telling you that life doesn't have to be full of sin, that it can be full of grace, of joy, of his life. And for those of you who are coming to the fullness of the Catholic Church, you're coming to see how God continues to offer himself in sacrament and in the word and in the worship of the, of the church. The gift of God is God. He who has the Holy Spirit is communion with us. Full of grace, therefore, means once again that Mary is wholly open human being, one who has opened herself entirely, one who has placed herself in God's hands boldly, limitlessly, and without fear for her own fate. It means that she lives wholly by and in relation to God. She is a listener and a prayer, whose mind and soul are alive to the manifold ways in which the living God quietly calls to her. She is one who prays and stretches forth wholly to meet God. She is therefore a lover who has the breadth and the magnanimity of true love, but who has also its unerring powers of discernment and its readiness to suffer. Being a Christian doesn't mean just letting things walk over you, letting the world trample on you, nor does it mean searching for things in the clouds and just great big signs, although those, although those might come. It, it means carrying oneself in connection in relation to God, being open to his hints, to his promptings, having an open ear in prayer, to his holy word, 
to Jesus, to the Holy Spirit, who brings everybody back to him. Some of the ways that we see God working in us is something that um, we call you know, the communication of properties or idioms. And just to go over a few of them, it helps us to see what does, it, what does a Christian life look like. Pope Benedict has told us a little bit about Mary, but maybe we could talk about some of those particular marks that you and I and sister might see in our own lives. A lot of these come from St. Augustine. In order that man might journey more trustfully toward the truth, the truth itself, the Son of God, having assumed human nature, God, fully God, fully man, having assumed human nature, established and founded faith. By having God's life in us, we're able to seek the truth more. We're able to stay, see in, in the stars and the clouds and, and in other people and in our own speech the truth of God, the glory of God that is wisdom and reason and everything that we see in the world. If God seems... Uh, invisible to us, all we need to do is look out and think about how God has created everything and how he has shown this in, our, in his Son for us to be able to see and adore and glorify him. Nothing was so necessary for raising our hope as to show us how deeply God loved us. And what could afford us a stronger proof of this than that the Son of God should become a partner with us of human nature? It's for the sake of our hope for carrying on God's love in the world that he became man, to show us what hope looks like. He has a lot of hope in you, and I hope you have a lot of hope in him, because he's true to his promises. What greater cause is there of the Lord's coming than to show God's love for us? If we have been slow to love, at least let us hasten to love in return. It's God's work on the cross in his Son that shows forth his mag magnificent love. He is willing to give it all, to suffer all, even if we refuse his love, he still remains there, willing to give it to us. Let's remember this any time we sin. Let us never despair, but hasten quickly to confession, to pour out our sins on him, to, to be rescued by him, as he did on Calvary. Man who might be seen was not to be followed. That's sinful men. Think about that. We're, we should not follow sinful people, but we do. We often follow ourselves, right? But God was to be followed. Who could not be seen? Again, God's visibility. That's what Jesus brings about. And therefore God was made man, that he who might be seen by man, Jesus, and whom man might follow, might be shown to man. Finally, God was made man, that man might be made God. Again, what we're trying to show you here is how the life of God makes us like God. It's, if, if you've picked up on some of the themes we've been talking about here, the way Jesus comes to man, being fully God, man gets to share in God. Now, we will not become gods. Let's just be very clear about this. But we will certainly become like God. And in this way, we bring Jesus to the world. there becomes this great chain in the world, starting with the apostles who first saw, met Jesus, those early Christian communities, the preaching to the ends of the world, particularly the love that they showed people. Again, how does God make himself visible? By the love men have through Jesus for other people. This comes out particularly in the, the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. Anytime we pray for a person, anytime we give a word of counsel, admonish a sinner, anytime that we give a cup of water to someone who's thirsty or food to somebody's hungry, we show God, we show Jesus in the world. And often enough, we might see Jesus in the, life, in the faces of those others who himself was left thirsty on the cross and hungry, who himself uh, was a prayer, who who hoped that the world would be saved and prayed for the dead, who will raise the dead. So it's by these actions that Jesus is alive in us. Again, the union of God and man. And again, Jesus, through us, 
closes that infinite gap to reach the rest of the world. Again, the reason that this matters is because I think we've all known what life is like, what life has been like without God. And if we know how good it is to, be, to have God in our life, we really need to bring it out there. Now, like I said, the Holy Spirit has probably already been active in your life. And one of the things that you'll receive at, uh, at Easter Vigil, in addition to baptism, is confirmation. Confirmation is the pouring of the Holy Spirit into the lives of believers. The Holy Spirit has gifts. And we can think of them as seven. And that's wisdom, understanding, counsel, knowledge, piety, fortitude, and fear of the Lord. When we look at Jesus, like we said, he was all wise, being God. He understood everybody. He gave counsel. He did not let the world walk over him, but was firm in, in what he said to people to draw them back to God. He was fully knowledgeable about what he had to do and what, what was the right thing to do about what needed to be explained to people to draw them back to God. He was pious. He prayed. He brought relief to the, to the hungry, to strangers. He, was for, he had fortitude to process it all, and he had reverence for his Father. No word of his was ever without effect. He was fully alive in everything that he do, did, and he, did not, he never wasted any moment of his life. Everything that he did was sacred. And that's what happens in confirmation. We won't be perfect. I, don't let me give you a false guarantee. But the gifts of the Holy Spirit being put in our lives are put to work in the world so that as people were drawn to Jesus, by these gifts of the Holy Spirit in us, the Holy Spirit being God, again, God is always bringing himself into our lives, and this in confirmation. We bring God into the world through the work of these gifts. Now, there are many fruits, like we said, joy particularly in the life of Mary and the life of Christians, the love that they had for other people, the love they knew God have, had for them, brought them great joy. And that's what makes our life very attractive to people. There will be times when we're sad. Life isn't always joyful. But we, sh we should still remember that we always have access to these gifts. We always have access to God. And by God living in us, people have access to God also. And that's, what we're, that's who we become. We become like God, like Jesus. And like we said, there's a lot of metaphysics that we can talk about here. But if you want to understand who the person of Jesus is, it's being on mission. And that's what we're calling you also to. Granted, you're just entering the church, but you will be put on mission. Not in far off lands or in places you don't know or languages you can't speak, although maybe you will. Really, the mission is going to be to the person next to you, to the people you already know. And it's going to be in a quiet, subtle way. Again, we, we point it to Mary, but in other ways, you might be called to speak more boldly, to have counsel and knowledge and understanding and, and be inspired a little more. But think about how the life of God continually shows itself and grows. And you might see people notice something in you. God's love revealed in the Eucharist. The word Eucharist means thanksgiving. As John Bolt II said, the Eucharist is the heart of the Christian life, that we receive Jesus himself. We use the word really, truly, and substantially to describe Christ's presence in the Holy Eucharist. Also, Jesus said, I am the living bread from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever, because this bread is my flesh, which I give, I will give for the life of the world. Christ instituted the Holy Eucharist in the Last Supper the night before he died. He took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, said, Take and 
eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup and wine, blessed it, and giving it to them, he said, All of you drink of this, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is be being sealed for many unto the forgiveness of sins. Finally, he gave his disciple the commission, do this in remembrance of me. God is not far us, far from us. He is here to be received in the Eucharist and implanted in us. The first chapters of the Gospel according to John, we read, the Word become flesh and pitch his tents among us. Through Eucharist, God is among us, nourish our spirits, and strengthen our faith with the Eucharist. Lai Chan Po cried out that the true purpose of our journeys is communion with God. He himself is the house of many dwelling places. From the gifts of the Eucharist, this is intimacy that that is the most person gift of the Lord. The strength of sacraments of the Eucharist go above and beyond the world of, of our churches. So the Eucharist is about food and eating, but even more, more important more importantly, it is about sharing the food that the Eucharist is. It is the will of God, the life and the love of God. The will of God is revealed in Jesus Christ. He is the center to the Eucharist. And the center of the Eucharist is to love God and love our neighbors, even our enemies and strangers. In fact, our love for our neighbors is a fresh fabric cutis for our love for God. And as Jesus taught us, we are liars if we say we love God without loving our neighbor. So when we receive the Eucharist, the gift from God, we unite it with Him and He invites us to share this gift from whatever you go. We bring Christ's presence in the size of bread onto the streets of our city, we entrust this street, this house, our daily life to His goodness. So eating together at the table of the Lord, the Lord's Supper, continual represent, represent again the Gospel, we also celebrate the reconciliation and relationship available to us because of His sacrifice and through His hospitality. This is the rule of Saint Benedict. This rule is based on the Gospel according to Matthew. I was a changer and you welcomed me. The Eucharist most fundamentally connects hospitality with God, with our neighbor and God because it anticipates and reveals the heavenly, heavenly table of the Lord in that sacrament. 
we are nourished on our journey toward God's banquet table, even as we experience the present joys and welcome as societies with sharing in that table. So we've come to the Eucharist, the final sacrament you will receive at Easter Vigil, but the sacrament you'll be receiving Sunday after Sunday. And this helps tie together everything that Sister and I have been talking about. Sister said that the Eucharist means thanksgiving. Jesus' whole life is thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for us, thanksgiving for his life. He knows it's going to be hard. But still, he offers it up, and he's returned. So this helps tie together everything we said about how God creates man, though man does not want to return in obedience, but he sends Jesus. And Jesus brings, God and brings man with himself back to God. Jesus is able to cross the gap. Again, the Eucharist is able to cross that infinite gap because... It really is Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. In this way, we become church. And becoming church is becoming the body of Christ, mystically and extensively, where each one of us, sister, you, all, all the baptized, we all become members of Jesus' body, so that when it comes to giving those corporal works of mercy that sister mentioned, or even the spiritual works of mercy, such as to endure injustice or to forgive willingly, at least not the things that Jesus did most especially when he gave himself on the cross. That's your way of becoming Jesus because Jesus first did this for us. We also imitate what he did. And these too become our acts of thanksgiving. To be church is to be Eucharistic. It is to be a thanksgiving people but not a Thanksgiving like in November, although that's a good way of giving Thanksgiving. It's to always give Thanksgiving as Jesus did to God. Remember, there's just nothing by ourselves that we can do to cross this gap. We need Jesus, and he extends to us. He calls us his friends. He extends the Eucharist. We share at his table. To become friends of God is to bring God's friendship to others and is to make every act that we do something magnificent, magnificent and super, something that will elevate the gaze of other people. Just as it's done for you and for me and for sister, in this way, all people come back to God, so long as we can bring God to all people. And this, again, makes the mission of the church very important. So we brought together some of these different ideas, again, all through the Easter Vigil, and how many of these sacramental acts not just help us remember, but also help us, yeah, they help us become Jesus. In this way, I want, I want us to keep a couple things in mind. One, God always gives the remedy, the obedience of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. In this way, God is made visible in love. We have a participation in this also. We become Jesus as Jesus was to us. And we are saved by the work of Jesus, and that work continues in us. Continues in, up, continues in us as acts of mercy to others. Thank you, sister. <laughs> Here's a couple other things I'd like us to think about. Whatever loves, grows. Now, God is infinite. There's no more growth to him. But we see in ways through the church, as she grows, grows in love, brings love to other people, she grows in persons. In this way, we should look at the communion of saints as present companions, as people who have seen that growth and who can continue to inspire us. Like I said, follow Jesus, follow Mary, you can't go wrong. But some of the saints can speak to us in particular in our own lives, whether it's our occupation or situation, country or family of origin. In this way, we should see that Christ, as he was born in Mary, was born in the heart of every believer. This is a good way to look at uh, our lives every day. 
How is Christ being born? How is he being incarnate? We know we're persons. How does God become in our person, in our humanity, through Jesus every day? How is he born in us as he was born in Mary? Finally, as love grows, uh, whatever loves, love grows and Christ is born in the hearts of the believer, I'd like us to think about something that Cardinal Blessed Newman said, and that is uh, growth is the only evidence of life. To be a Christian is never to be sterile. Remember what we said uh, about Abraham. He knew he was going to die. His sterility was going to be just the worst. The, the ending of, uh, of his own, of symbolically, the whole human race. Our growth in love is evidence of life. Again, it makes visible, it makes God visible as we grow in love. So whenever we despair about how do we see God in our own lives, or how can we tell God is alive to other people? We need to think about how are we making that love alive and active. If we're ever despairing of, uh, of God's role in the world, the more we tap into Jesus in prayer, in sacrament, in counsel with, with, with others, with uh, the communion of saints, meditations on the Blessed Virgin, as we become more church, we see God in our lives. I don't want to pretend that I can give any guarantee. And sometimes the hardest periods of our life are going to be seen, will seem like the darkest of nights when God is no, nowhere to be near. But by perseverance, by, by looking to Jesus, who again, fully God, but fully man, knowing what it would be like to feel so, so lonely and in some ways feeling abandoned by God, we can see what it means to make it through so that we can return and in a, as our faith in God grows, we see how he continues to grow in us. So we're very happy to have you. We're looking forward to more nights like this when we can explain some more of these in, in detail. But right now, we hope that you've learned that Jesus is fully God, fully man, that God is love. He makes himself visible in Jesus, and God makes him visible in you through Jesus. Thank you for your coming.